Good morning, dear students. Today we will study a little bit more about absorption by roots. So let's start by studying about a potato osmoscope. So what exactly is an osmoscope? It's a device used to study osmosis. So here we have used potato. A raw potato is taken. It is peeled and a small cavity is made in the middle. The cavity is made in such a manner that the base is still intact. After you have peeled it and made a cavity, you fill that cavity with concentrated sugar solution and you place water in a petri dish and place this entire setup in a petri dish. Now, the initial level of sugar solution is marked with a pin. After a few minutes to one hour, half an hour, you notice that the inner level of solution has risen further. So you mark the final level with another oil pen. Thereafter, there is no further increase in the amount of water in the inner cavity. Now, this is how it is noted. So you have the initial level marked with an oil pen and you have the final level marked with an oil pen. In this case, why is there an inward movement of water? Because water is more outside the potato as compared to inside, because inside it is sugar solution. Sugar solution has lesser water. So water always moves from higher concentration to lower concentration. And we mark that process by the positions of the oil pens. So this indicates inward movement of water or we use the term end osmosis. Here the potato osmoscope, the potato acts like a semi-permeable membrane. Now if you were to taste this water which is present outside, the water outside will not taste sweet, indicating that only movement of water has taken place. The sugar molecules have not been displaced. Um, whatever you are seeing, there are various setups to study the process of endosmosis. The potato osmoscope has already been explained to you. Now the other is, for example, here, the whisking tube. Now this whisking tube is also used to demonstrate endosmosis. So we have two setups, the control and the test setup. The control setup is a setup in which the process of endosmosis or exosmosis will not occur. This happens because the solution inside and outside are isotonic. That means they have the same concentration of molecules inside and outside. So we have taken water in and water out, separated by the whisking tube. So net movement of water molecule becomes zero. So there is no increase in the mass of the whisking tube. But in the test setup, what we have taken is 60% sucrose in the whisking tube and there is water present outside in the beaker. So inward movement of water takes place from this whisking tube due to which the volume and the mass of the whisking tube has increased, indicating endosmosis. Now here we have whisking tube containing salt solution, which is colored. So the initial level is at this point and the final level has risen once the whisking tube is placed in a beaker full of water. Water is more outside, water is less inside, so endosmosis occurs, which leads to rise in the level of water in this tubing. Now, in this setup, you have cellophane paper containing concentrated sugar, cane sugar solution. Now, this is the control setup where the polythene bag or the cellophane paper containing the cane sugar was placed outside in air and nothing happened to it after a couple of hours also. But the one cellophane paper containing cane sugar solution was dipped in a beaker containing water, it swelled up due to endosmosis. So all these processes display that movement of water takes place. In all these situations, the water outside does not taste sweet or salty, indicating that endosmosis here is only involved in the movement of water molecules. Now you might wonder why does osmosis stop after some time? Why is it that it does not continue forever? The process of osmosis only is involving the movement of water molecules. Water molecules move from a region of their higher concentration to a region of their lower concentration. That means from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution till a certain change in the height of the two solutions is achieved. Now, once this 
water column has achieved a particular height, the uh, height of the water column exerts a backward pressure. This backward pressure will prevent any further osmosis from taking place. And this is called as osmotic pressure. So if we need to measure this osmotic pressure, this can be measured by a simple piston arrangement in a thistle funnel. So we have a thistle funnel filled with 10% sugar solution. Its one end is covered with a semi-permeable membrane. Any kind of semi-permeable membrane can be used. We can use a whisking tube, we can use an animal bladder, we can use an egg membrane. And it is placed in a beaker containing pure water. The upper end is attached to a piston. Piston is an arrangement like a syringe piston. So here, the initial level is marked and after some time we notice that the level of solution has risen in the thistle funnel. So the final level is also marked. Now if we attach some weight to bring the final level back to its initial level here, the amount of weight or the amount of pressure which we have to apply, that will give us a measure of the osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure, in other words, is the pressure used to prevent osmosis. Osmotic pressure is the pressure exerted which allows osmosis. It is also the pressure used to prevent osmosis. Now, there are different kinds of solutions show different kinds of osmosis. There are three types of solutions as you have already studied, hypotonic, isotonic and hypertonic solution. Their tonicity depends upon the concentration of solutes and solvent. The solvent in most cases, in case of plants especially, happens to be water. So we are assuming the solvent to be water and continuing as such. So a hypotonic solution will have more water, less solute. Isotonic will have the same amount of solute and solvent inside and outside the cell. When you talk about tonicity, you always compare the solution concentration inside the cell and outside where it is placed. Hypertonic would mean less water, more solute in the solution than present in the cell. Now, an animal cell has only outer cell membrane. It does not have a rigid cell wall. So the behavior of the animal cell will be slightly different from the behavior of the plant cell. If an animal cell is placed in a hypotonic solution, it will absorb too much of water and the cell will burst or it will be lysed. If an animal cell is placed in an isotonic solution, equal number of water molecules will move to and fro across the cell membrane, keeping the animal cell in a normal state. If an animal cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, on the other hand, it will start losing too much of water and the animal cell will be shriveled or we say it will die. If a plant cell, on the other hand, is placed in a hypotonic solution, the plant cell will absorb water, will become turgid, will swell up, and this is said to be the normal state of every plant cell. On the other hand, if a plant cell is placed in isotonic solution, it will lose water equal to the amount of water which it will draw in. Or in other words, it will become soft, it will remain soft, but it will not become turgid. When it becomes soft, that state is said to be flaccid. If on the other hand, a plant cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, it loses too much of water from the vacuole. The cell membrane detaches from the cell wall and we say the plant cell has become plasmalized or shriveled. The space between cell wall and cell membrane gets filled with hypertonic solution. Why does it get filled with hypertonic solution? Because the cell wall is freely permeable to anything in solution. So the solution will easily pass through the cell wall and occupy this space. As the cell membrane is detaching itself, this space is available. So the cell membrane and the cell wall are covered around with the hypertonic solution. Now, before you proceed further with the term plasmolysis, you need to know these two pressures in plant cells. They are turgor pressure and mole pressure. 
Please remember these two terms are associated with plant cells only because animal cells do not have a cell wall. So when the water moves due to difference in their osmotic concentration, that is the osmotic pressure which is applied for entry of water, it is up to the cell how it behaves. So the cell will have two pressures balancing each other in a normal state. These two pressures are called as turbo pressure and the pole pressure. Turbo pressure is the pressure of cell contents on the cell wall. When a cell is full of water, it will have a lot of turbo pressure. On the other hand, wall pressure is the pressure of cell wall on the cell contents. In any ideal cell, these two pressures have to balance each other. So the wall pressure will prevent the cell from expanding further. Now, if turgor pressure is equal to wall pressure, then the cell becomes flaccid. This is noted in case of an isotonic solution when the cell is placed in an isotonic solution. If the turgor pressure exceeds wall pressure, then the cell becomes turgid. This happens when a cell is placed in hypotonic solution. If the turgor pressure is less than wall pressure, then the cell becomes plasmalized. This is noted when a cell is placed in hypertonic solution. Now next you have the last type of transportation in case of plants that is called as active transport. Active transport is the type of transport which takes place against concentration gradient. That means from low concentration to high concentration using energy in the form of ATP. It can be from outside the cell to inside or from inside the cell to outside, depending upon the requirement. Generally, active transport is associated with the distribution or absorption of minerals. Metallic ions, minerals, when they have to be absorbed, they are absorbed by active transport. Now, what next you are going to do is the stages of plasmolysis. You understand that when a cell especially a plant cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, the plant cell will have uh, the undergo this condition of plasmolysis. But in order to become plasmolyzed, it will undergo a number of steps. If a normal cell is placed in hypertonic solution, the cell wall will detach from the cell membrane. The cytoplasm will contract slightly. So the plasmolysis has just begin, begun. Okay, At this stage, the plasmolysis has just begun. So we call this as incipient plasmolysis. Now, if it is still placed inside that hypertonic solution, the solution is not removed, the plasmolysis exceeds further, continues further. It becomes clearly visible. The cell membrane and cell wall are detached. We call this as evident plasmolysis. If it is still allowed to remain inside the concentrated solution. Now the cell wall completely detaches from the cell membrane. The cell membrane comes in the middle and accumulates itself here. The vacuole is completely devoid of any water. This cell is said to be plasmolyzed. If this plasmolyzed cell is taken and put in pure water, okay, if it is immediately put in pure water, it will undergo a change in state and will acquire the normal healthy state. The vacuole will again reabsorb water and we call this process as reversal of plasmolysis or deplasmolysis. If nothing is done, the plasmolyzed cell will die. So plant cells on plasmolysis, if before the cell dies, you transfer it in pure water, they will undergo deplasmolysis and they will again become a normal cell. But if not, then the plasmal plasmalized cell is ultimately going to die. Now, what are the various uses of all these phenomena? Osmosis is used to preserve food. You have pickles and jams and food items which can be preserved either in a salt solution or high salt environment, high sugar environment. All of these basically will provide a hypertonic solution. Once a hypertonic medium is provided, any bacterial spores, any fungal spores, if they try to fall inside, they will undergo the process of plasmolysis and they will die. So this is very important in food preservation. 
Now, osmosis or plasmolysis also finds its way in case of taking care of weeds. There are biological methods of taking care of weeds. If any weed is sprinkled with a lot of salt, ordinary common salt, then it will undergo plasmolysis. The roots will remove water, undergo plasmolysis, and they will, because of exosmosis, water is drawn out from the roots. And then the roots, when they die, the entire plant dies. So this is the method by which weed control can be done. It is also noted that if crops are given too much of fertilizers, then this also leads to plasmolysis in their roots, leading to decreased crop, fail, uh, crop production. So too much of fertilizers, in other words, are bad for crop growth. So here, all of these indicate basically that weed control can be done just by uh, sprinkling high concentration of salt. Then where is turgidity noted? Turgidity, which is achieved if a lot of water is absorbed by a plant by endosmosis, it will give stiffness to soft tissues in the plant, like leaves, like small green stems, the flowers. If you provide them water, they will stand erect. If they stand erect, they are exposing the leaves to the sunlight for absorbing uh, it for photosynthesis. So it provides stiffness to soft tissues. Turgidity also helps to provide a pressure called as the turbo pressure, which helps roots to push through hard ground. Now roots, when they are pushing through hard ground, they will be able to grow the radical deeper and the plumule above for development of roots and the leaves. Then turbor in root cells also helps to build up root pressure. Now, if you were to observe a simple experiment, any healthy watered plant is cut near its base and a rubber tube is attached with a manometer filled with mercury and this setup is left as such. After some time, we notice that some liquid rises from here and pushes the mercury up in the column. This liquid here is basically the cell sap, which is rising because the roots were continuously absorbing water, creating an upward pressure called as the root pressure. This is one of the primary forces in ascent of sap. It helps in the movement of water up in tall trees. It's one of the primary forces which will allow water to reach up to the tallest of trees. So here also a small stump and if you simply attach a mercury manometer, you'll notice that the liquid will push this mercury level up, indicating that root pressure has allowed this liquid to push the mercury column. So this root pressure is generated because of turgidity. The turgor in root pressure helps to build up root pressure. Now, what you are noticing in front is the strength of turgidity or the strength of root pressure. Now, all of these are plants which are developing in areas where soft tissue should not be growing, whether it's top of a building or in between a building or going through walls and cracks of the hard concrete ground. In all these cases, this is only possible because the roots exert such excessive forces that they can crack and grow through hard rocky surfaces, hard buildings, concrete roads, monuments and other structures. So this is basically due to turbo pressure. Now, when you're doing turbo pressure, it makes sense to do this process called mutation. Now, mutation is basically an outcome of root pressure. During humidity, conditions of ex extreme environmental moisture and very low temperatures. This is basically a process observed in herbaceous plants, small sized plants, where small water droplets are observed on the leaf margins. These water droplets are observed on margins of certain herbaceous plants, indicating that the veins are ending here and this liquid is coming from the roots. This liquid, this 
droplet of water, these droplets which are not seen, they are called as gutation. So what is gutation basically? Gutation is when the environment is humid, the rate of transpiration is low, the temperatures are low and the roots are absorbing too much of water. That surplus water which accumulates in the plants is thrown out of the plants through the ending of leaf veins. So wherever the leaf veins are ending, they have small openings here. These openings are called as hydrothotes. We also call them as water stomata. So through these hydrothotes, the water comes in the form of a droplet and it is exuded out. So you notice these droplets early in the morning. These are gutation droplets. They are noticed in herbaceous plants, small height plants, even in plants like banana, it is noticed. So they are basically through the openings, which we call as hydrothotes. Then another thing which the plants demonstrate, uh, by which the plants demonstrate uh, root pressure is bleeding. When any injury occurs in a plant, the plant starts to lose its cell sap from that injured point. It can be the stem which is injured, it can be the root which is injured, it can be the fruit which is injured or the leaf is injured. The cell sap oozes out and it oozes out for con some considerable time. This is because the roots are continuously pushing water up the cells are up and wherever the injured portion is, the extra cells are oozes out through that opening. So this is also due to high root pressure. Now the turbo pressure helps in opening and closing of stomata. Stomata are basically structures through which primary, primarily exchange of gases occurs. They are found on the surface of leaves, more on the lower surface and they help in exchange of gases. So these stomata, they are controlled by these structures called as the guard cells. When the guard cells are turgid, they open the stomata. When the guard cells become flaccid, they close the stomata. So there's an opening and closing of stomata is regulated by the turgor pressure of the guard cells. Then there is a plant called Mimosa pudica, the touch me not plant. It's also called as the large one tea plant. If you touch this plant, the leaves droop, the leaflets droop like this. The moment you touch it, human contact or any animal contact will cause its leaves to droop. Now, why this drooping occurs? Because at the base of the leaflet, there is a small tissue called as the pulvinus. This tissue, the pulvini or the pulvinus, this tissue basically loses its uh, turgidity on contact. When it loses its turgidity, the plant cell, the entire plant leaflet will wilt temporarily. It's only a temporary process. The moment the human touch is removed, they will regain their turgid condition. Now, whatever processes you have studied, let's study their importance in the root, how they help in absorption of water. So first for water, water is drawn near the root here by imbibition. So with imbibition, the water comes near the root here because the uh, root here has outer structure made of cell wall, which is cellulose. So it attracts the water near its surface by imbibition. Once the water is attracted by imbibition, it enters in by osmosis. Once it has entered in by osmosis, it spreads evenly in the cell by diffusion. So by cell to cell osmosis, the water ultimately reaches the xylem where because of transpiration, because of root pressure, upward movement of water takes place and it reaches the leaves. Now, when the water is moving, there are two pathways which are followed, either the epoplast pathway or the symplast pathway. Epoplast means the water is moving through the cell wall. The water moves from one cell wall to the other cell wall. That means by the process of imbibition. And the second one is through the cytoplasm. This movement takes place because of osmosis. So the water actually enters inside the cell, reaches the cytoplasm, and from this cytoplasm reaches the next cytoplasm. So epoplast means without entering the cytoplasm. Symplast means with entering the cytoplasm. So these two pathways basically determine the movement of water. 
And the last topic for today is absorption of water and mineral, the absorption of mineral elements by root hair. Now this process uses active transport. Now you have done three processes which are passive. The absorption takes place by diffusion, imbibition and osmosis. That is passive, it doesn't involve any energy. But when you talk about movement of mineral elements, it takes place by using energy in the form of ATP. This will also take place across the root here. Here, there will be involvement of energy that will be called as active transport. So that is all about the absorption of mineral elements and the water. Next, we will have the experiments, which we will do in the next video. So thank you very much.